So as we begin, HRCT and the multi-detector CT era. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of HRCT and how it's evolved into multi-detector acquisitions, what that means in terms of setting up a patient protocol, and what the limitations and pitfalls are related to that technique. An important structure is the border of the secondary pulmonary lobule, which is the interlobular septum. Familiar to most of us on the chest x-ray is the curly B line when we see it. At a minimum, HRCT technique consists of thin collimation combined with a high spatial frequency reconstruction algorithm. Thin collimation has generally met between 1 and 1.5 millimeters, but with today's multi-detector CT scanners, that can now mean sub-millimeter collimation, 0.5 millimeters, 0.6 millimeters. The high spatial frequency reconstruction algorithm, I'll show you some comparisons to standard soft tissue reconstruction algorithms, gives us an edge enhancing very similar to as done for bone imaging, making the edges of small lines and small nodules more discernible and hopefully making them more conspicuous. Imaging spacing, particularly in the non-multi-detector era, has been variable and largely incremental, where images were obtained with large areas of skip between them. It could have been one image every three or four centimeters throughout the lungs, or as close as at one centimeter increments. Imaging is usually performed in the supine position, but prone imaging is particularly important to exclude the dependent opacity as a mimic of lung disease. Imaging is primarily performed at end inspiration to get the best lung detail and separation of diseased and normal structures, but end expiratory images provide an important role in looking for evidence of small airway disease that may not be visible on the inspiration images. And since the disease processes that cause shortness of breath, one of the reasons that interstitial lung disease is suspected, could be related to any number of disease processes, as many of the speakers here are going to be discussing, and expiratory images may be useful. People have performed targeted reconstructions where the entire pixel matrix is, is used to reconstruct one, image, one lung or the other lung, but primarily this has fall, fallen out of favor and not too many places use this as the primary way they review the images. With multi-detector CT, now we use multi-detector helical CT acquisition so that we have volumetric HRCT with contiguous images from lung apex to base, a true isotropic image set, as you would for a CT angiogram of the aorta, and this gives us some advantages. Let's look at the impact of a few technical variables on image quality, and the first of those is slice thickness. This is a 2.5 millimeter image in which we can see some low attenuation areas here, here, and here. And an important distinction is going to be whether there is a wall around these black holes or not. Black spaces or black holes with no walls is pretty much the definition of emphysema, whereas to see a wall around it would indicate cysts, which is a different differential diagnosis. On a thicker section image, two and a half millimeters, you would partial volume away the edges of small cyst walls with adjacent lung and you might not see them at all. With a 1.25 millimeter technique, we can see that there are just barely discernible thin little white edges around these black spaces, making these cysts and not areas of emphysema. Here is another comparison of standard CT technique versus HRCT technique. This is a one centimeter slice using a soft tissue algorithm, and at the same anatomic level, a one and a half millimeter thin section using a high spatial frequency reconstruction algorithm. There's no anatomic difference in the location of these images, but the amount of lung detail visible at HRCT is readily obvious. On the thick section, we have increase in lung parenchymal opacity. We can just barely see some vessels through it, and we see very little detail at all with respect to small airways. Note we also don't see the fissures. The fissure is an avascular plane. On the thin section HRCT image, we see the fissure for what it is, areas of mesothelial cells with submesothelial connective tissue. We see many small airways in cross-section, which we're not able to see with the thicker sections. And within that ground glass opacity, we can also appreciate a fine lacy pattern in the underlying interstitium, not evident on a conventional CT image. In the setting of conditions like asbestosis, the HRCT image can be particularly useful because it may be hard to distinguish between pleural plaques and, and asbestosis. 
Is this blurry abnormality along the edge of the lung next to the plaque just a plaque with partial volume averaging, or is it real lung parenchymal disease? And by using thin sections in the high spatial frequency reconstruction algorithm, we can clearly see the thin, lacy, intralobular septal lines of asbestosis. So this patient doesn't just have asbestos-related pleural disease, they have asbestosis involving the pulmonary parenchyma. And the last comparison of CT versus HRCT images is this. A 10 millimeter standard soft tissue algorithm image versus an HRCT and a patient with biopsy proven usual interstitial pneumonitis, which on HRCT is characterized by honeycombing, contiguous cystic spaces. This is end stage fibrotic lung, well shown in radiologic pathologic correlation. But if you take the same patient at the same time and reconstruct the data into a thicker slice and don't use a high spatial frequency reconstruction algorithm, All these little tiny honeycomb cyst walls blur together and could be mistaken as being ground glass opacity. And why is that important? Because in cases of UIP, ground glass opacity may be potentially reversible disease. And patients with ground glass opacity may be given more aggressive cytotoxic medications to treat potentially reversible disease and improve function. Whereas patients with purely honeycombing, which is irreversible, are less likely to be given those toxic medications, which have side effects. This is our multi-detector HRCT protocol. Our acquisition includes three passes, a volumetric and spiratory helical acquisition where we reconstruct 1.25 millimeter images contiguously throughout the entire lungs from apex to base. Our clinical expiratory protocol is still still incremental to minimize radiation dose with one image every two centimeters throughout the lungs at expiration. And similarly, in the prone position, we perform the same incremental imaging. Many research protocols, however, now are volumetric in all three phases, volumetric inspiration, volumetric expiration, and volumetric prone imaging. The viewing, of course, for a multi-detector HRCT protocol is going to be multiplanar and interactive. It's no longer going to be looking at axial images alone, just like you would not accept for an angiographic study. Here's an example of a patient with emphysema. Image targeted here in the right upper lobe shows you the low attenuation spaces, often around small central lobular vessels, central lobular emphysema, but in one axial image, all you see is the upper lobe. In a coronal reformatted image from a multi-detector volumetric CT, in one image I can show the referring clinician not only the presence of disease in the apices, but the absence of disease in the base, so they get an idea of severity and distribution very quickly, as well as looking at the central tracheobronchial tree, which is not a reliable way to look at the airway if your technique is incremental with areas of skip between them. Here's another example, cystic fibrosis, single axial image, severe bronchiectasis, bronchial wall thickening, and a mosaic attenuation pattern in the background lung due to small airway disease and air trapping. But cystic fibrosis can be better shown in this fashion here, sagittal and coronal reformats, very much like a PA and lateral chest x-ray, the way clinicians are used to approaching chest disease and the way they look at their patients from the front, from the side. Same thing now is possible with the multi-detector CT images, and again, quickly shows from apex to base, from front to back and side to side, the distribution and severity of the disease, which one axial image cannot convey. And a third example of multi-detector volumetric imaging and usual interstitial pneumonitis, again, we can see the subpleural lower lung predominant honeycombing, the associated traction bronchiectasis, and sparing of disease in the upper lung. So multi-detector CT, high-resolution technique, is an interactive three-dimensional data set. Well, is it just a bunch of pretty images that help the clinicians appreciate the disease, or does it actually help us in diagnosis? Well, there are some things that it can help us with. Differentiating between cysts and cystic bronchiectasis, because now the images are contiguous with no skip areas, so you can trace cystic areas and see are they running into airways or not. It allows us to look both at the small and large airways in one pass, the tracheobronchial tree, the uh, segmental, subsegmental bronchi of the lung, as well as the small airways by looking for air trapping in a more diffuse pattern. 
In addition, it's very important to be able to correctly review and characterize small pulmonary nodules. And many of the patients who come for HRCT are at increased risk of lung cancer. Patients with interstitial lung disease and patients with emphysema are all at increased risk of lung cancer. So you're commonly going to find small pulmonary nodules, some of which will prove to be cancer. And being able to compare their size over time when you're comparing their interstitial lung disease or emphysema over time is important. With incremental images, you may catch the middle of the nodule on one exam or the edge of the nodule on the next exam and not have the best section through each nodule to measure them. So an example of where volumetric HRCT helps in the presence of low attenuation spaces is here in the right upper lobe, multiple small black spaces with thin walls around them. Well, are these branching bronchi or is this cystic lung disease? If you have incremental images with a one or two centimeter gap between them, it can be very hard to tell. With the volumetric image, you can rotate the data set into the best plane for these structures, and here you can see it's clearly a branching tubular structure, bronchiectasis, not individual cysts or cystic lung disease. And in another example of a patient with NSIP, we have the interstitial abnormality, we have dilated bronchi, and we have this little cystic space. Is it a cyst or potential area of honeycombing, or is this a dilated bronchus? And by looking at it in a volumetric fashion, we can trace the bronchus in the best plane for that airway into the space, confirming that it's bronchiectasis. One question I often get asked about volumetric HRCT is, can I or should I do it with IV contrast? For instance, working up a patient for pulmonary embolism and interstitial lung disease at the same time, or working up a patient for pulmonary hypertension excluding both lung disease and chronic PE in the same setting. And I usually tell people that's not really a good idea because you're going to get limited evaluation of the lungs in multi-detector CTs with contrast. If you stop and look at the lungs on a pulmonary embolism CT, you'll notice what is called the hurricane artifact, which is essentially a beam hardening artifact that's exaggerated with multi-slice CT. This is an example of a lung image, thin section, just like an HRCT is, 1.25 millimeters from a pulmonary embolism CT. But look at all the vessels, little C-shaped or comma-shaped structures with low attenuation on one side. And if you scroll through these areas up and down, you'll note they swirl, hence the name hurricane artifact. This can make it very difficult to look at the underlying lung and exclude particularly mild interstitial lung disease. I don't think you'd have a problem excluding overt honeycombing, but excluding ground glass opacity or mosaic attenuation or subtle nodularity would be difficult routinely on pulmonary embolism exams. So when our clinicians ask us, can they get both, what we usually do is do the second acquisition at low MA for the lungs, and then we follow it with the contrast for the pulmonary embolism exam. So once you know that you've gotten a good quality CT and you know the important parameters to obtain a volumetric HRCT, now you're going to set about interpretation. And for that, you need to know what a normal HRCT should look like. In general, there should be about a clear one centimeter peripheral zone around the anterior and lateral aspect of the lungs. When you get to the dependent lung, where there will be some degree of dependent opacity, where the vessels get closer to the pleural surface, you're going to see them looking as if they're touching the edge of the lung parenchyma. But you shouldn't see that in the anterolateral aspect. That should always be clear. In general, you should not see any small airways in the peripheral third of the lung parenchyma. To see them there would be abnormal. They would be bronchiol bronchioloectasis. A few other pitfalls to think about when looking at the HRCT images. And one I've mentioned already is dependent opacity that mimics real interstitial lung disease. It's more common in smokers. It's more common with increasing age. And that's one of the reasons that we always do prone images for HRCT exams. Here's an example of a patient whose lungs were otherwise unremarkable but for the presence of dependent opacity. Is this real disease? Is this real, just mild, subpleural lower lung disease, or is this dependent opacity? Without the prone images, my report isn't going to be quite clear that the lungs are normal or not. But by doing the prone images at the same setting, the opacity goes away when the patient's placed prone. It's dependent analectasis. This is not interstitial lung disease. 
In contrast to this patient who has dependent predominant opacity in the, lung ab in the lungs, again, what is it, real or not real? And when this patient is placed prone, the abnormality persists. This is real interstitial lung disease. Another thing to make sure that you um, are aware of when you're looking at HRCT images to, is a, to use a consistent window width and level combination. If you don't, you may overcall or undercall disease. There's really no one absolute correct window width or level setting. The width is generally between 1,000 and 2,000, and the level between minus 500 and minus 700. We use a window width of 1,200 and a level of minus 600 routinely on our HRCTs. But if you look at the literature across many different experts who report on HRCT, you'll see wide ranges. But the important thing is that you use it consistently so the lungs don't look lighter today and darker tomorrow. In particular, if you're given hard copy film from another institution where it's been printed at a window level combination that's not what you're used to, you need to take that into account when doing the interpretation. And failure to do so will make you either overcall or undercall ground glass opacity. You may call bronchial wall thickening that's not really there. You may hide emphysema. And here's an example, an exaggerated example, to show you this, um, the thinking here. This is a targeted image through the right upper lobe. And if you look in this area, we have some fuzzy ground glass opacity and ground glass type central lobular nodules. If we change the window level width extremely in one direction, I could make the lungs look like diffuse ground glass opacities with the more focal ones. And if I change it in the other direction, I can take those fuzzy ground glass nodules, which may be indicative of respiratory bronchiolitis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and change them into looking like discrete little miliary nodules, which has a very different differential diagnosis, miliary tuberculosis or fungal infection or metastases. Another pitfall in HRCT is increased image noise. And while most of our HRCTs are done with low MA, because you don't need a whole lot of dose to get good lung image quality, and if you're not using low MA technique, especially in light of continued um, discussions about the seriousness of over-radiating people with CT, I really suggest that you go back and lower your MA on your HRCT protocols. Down to 40 or 60 MAS is perfectly acceptable to get good quality lung images. But every once in a while, you'll be challenged by a patient that no matter how much MAS you generate, the image still looks like this. And the reason, of course, for this is the upsizing of the population. So in a case like this where you have uh, more body than you have lung parenchyma to image, what I usually recommend is to just increase your slice thickness for reconstruction. So instead of reconstructing your images at a half millimeter, a millimeter, a millimeter, a quarter, reconstruct them at two, two and a half, or three. You get more signal relative to the noise, and it won't look so bad. You'll get some diagnostic capability out of the images you generate. And then a word of caution. A normal HRCT does not entirely 100% exclude interstitial lung disease. There will be some cases, such as this case, of mild interstitial lung disease where the HRCT looks completely normal. And we reported a series about a dozen years ago of patients who went to surgical lung biopsy with normal HRCTs. They had clinical suspicion of disease. They had pulmonary function test abnormality suspecting disease. They were strong enough to go on to surgical lung biopsy, even in the face of a normal HRCT. And their disease was present, but again, it was mild relative to the patients who have abnormal lungs on CT. So every once in a while, this may come up. Does it entirely exclude disease? Not entirely, generally so, but in the face of strong clinical evidence, a surgical biopsy might still be warranted. I put ground glass opacity up here as a pitfall, and the reason for that is it has such a long, long differential diagnosis. Unlike things like honeycombing that we know are irreversible pulmonary fibrosis, ground glass opacity can represent many, many things. The definition of ground glass opacity is increased lung parenchymal attenuation through which you can still see normal vascular architecture. So if you look at this image at the right lower lobe, the lung is too white, almost diffusely, but I can still see the branching vessels through it. If it were so white that I could no longer see the vessels, that, of course, would be consolidation. 
Now, ground glass opacity, as I said, has this long differential diagnosis. And basically, if you think about anything that can cause alveolar opacity in a chest radiograph or alveolar disease, it can cause ground glass opacity. And of course, that includes things such as edema, cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic, infections, particularly things like CMV and PCP can manifest primarily with ground glass opacity. Any number of the alveolidities from UIP to NSIP to DIP to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and Dr. Galvin is going to talk to us more specifically about the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Alveolar proteinosis gives us a lot of ground glass opacity. One of the reasons that ground glass opacity is also a pitfall is it can represent fibrosis that is below the resolution limit of HRCT. We like to think of ground glass opacity in the setting of pneumonitis as being inflammatory and active and something that can be treated and, and, and when treated improve patient outcome and symptoms, but sometimes it actually represents fibrosis and that CT cannot resolve the difference of. So the good thing is if you have it, it may represent an active inflammatory process that's potentially reversible, but the bad and the ugly is it could be fibrosis that's irreversible. And how can you distinguish between them? This is a series from Anne Young and colleagues where they looked primarily at this issue of ground glass opacity and did HRCT pathologic correlation in 27 patients where ground glass was the major abnormality on HRCT. 80% of those patients did have potentially reversible disease when the pathology specimens were reviewed. 20% actually had irreversible fibrosis. So that defines a problem. Martine Remy Jardin showed us a way to help us out of this pitfall of is ground glass inflammatory or fibrotic. In her study of 26 patients with predominantly or exclusively ground glass opacity, in two thirds of the patients that ground glass was inflammatory and a third of it, it was fibrotic. But what they noted is that 85% of the patients in which the ground glass opacity was actually fibrosis, they had bronchiectasis. They didn't have honeycombing, but they had bronchiectasis. So if you see predominantly ground glass opacity in the setting of an interstitial pneumonitis and you see associated bronchiectasis, that should be an indicator that's most likely fibrosis and not active inflammation. Now, there are a lot of specific diagnoses that can be made on HRCT, and you could spend an entire morning or full day symposium discussing each and every one of those diseases and the major and minor findings that you can see. These conditions include emphysema, that Dr. Bankier is going to talk about at the end of the session, cystic lung diseases, alveolar proteinosis, radiation pneumonitis, amiodarone toxicity, sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, respiratory bronchiolitis, lymphadenic tumor spread, these are all things where we can play an important role in coming to a specific diagnosis when looking at HRCT. So while I don't have myself time to go through the patterns and the features of all of these diseases today, these are the things that you should consider you're able to make a diagnosis of very consistently with HRCT in your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ella. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to provide you a general approach to looking at the interstitial lung diseases. And one of the problems that we're going to see with this is that there's not as good agreement as you and I would hope amongst the pathologists. And you and I know that we can only correlate with what the pathologists tell us they can see. The other problem we're going to find here is that a lot of the names that are used are legacy names. In other words, a lot of these diseases were named in the 60s and 70s. And for a variety of reasons, they have kept those names, even though they know they lo no longer represent the pathophysiology which you and I look at. So what I hope to do for you in the next 29 minutes is that I will show you a general approach to these diseases, the role that smoking plays, and to leave you with a general pattern approach to looking at diffuse lung disease that is not infectious. So the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. The first thing is the lovely presentation that Ella gave you talked about the anatomy of the secondary lobule, so I don't need to go through that. Just to tell you that those people who have these chronic infiltrative lung diseases have abnormalities 
that for the most part do not involve the airway, which here we see the central bronchiole and arterial that goes into the center of the secondary lobule. So if we look at the abnormality in these people with the, quote, interstitial pneumonias, most of the abnormality is within the secondary lobule in the area of the alveoli themselves. We will see specifically in those patients who smoke cigarettes that there's going to be inflammation around those airways, but for the most part, we're not talking about distortion of ab or abnormality of the airways themselves. And as a result, most of these patients have what is called restrictive physiology, meaning that a clinician sees somebody who has small lungs. They can blow out the normal air that you would expect them to. If I asked you to blow all the air out in your lungs, you could blow 70% out in one second. These patients are able to do that, but their lungs are small. And so as a consequence the, of their shrinking lungs, you and I expect to see small lungs if we were to look at a plain radiograph. Their pulmonary functions would show restrictive physiology. And for the most part, these people got sick over months to years. So from the clinician's point of view, they're short of breath, they got sick over months, their lung volumes are small, and their airway function appears to be relatively normal. Uh, the American, the uh, European Respiratory Society and the ATS got together and created a group to look at these diseases. And they were based on what Avril Liebau showed in the early 70s. So as I said, most of the descriptions of these diseases were from Avril Liebau. And what he showed is, if you look at, this, at the images you see here, is that the alveolar walls are thickened, and the blue area here are areas of fibrosis. But he knew, even though he called these, quote, interstitial lung diseases I mean, involving the alveolar wall, he also knew that a lot of the disease were really cells which were in the alveolar spaces. So though, even though we, as radiologists, have taken this to mean exclusively interstitial lung disease, in fact, most of these diseases have involvement of both the alveolar spaces and the alveolar wall. And this is the list. So in this very short period of time, I'm going to try to give you what is the typical appearance for each one of these diseases. I cannot go into great detail, but I think it will allow you with an early window into understanding them. The first, and probably one of the most important, as Ella points out, is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Again, one of the problems is just the name. In general, IPF, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is what the clinician will say when they are trying to describe this disease. The pathologist, when they see the abnormality associated with IPF, will call it the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, UIP. One point I want you to take away is when a pathologist says UIP, although it is part of the diagnosis, it is not specific. There are definitely patients who have other diseases. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is one of them, sarcoidosis, who occasionally will have the UIP pattern of fibrosis. It is not specific. The next three diseases, respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, and pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, all three of these can be thought of as smoking-related inflammatory diseases. Each of them was named somewhere between 20 and 40 years ago before we knew that. So we used to call things DIP because we thought type 2 pneumocytes were falling into the alveolar spaces. The name has never been changed. We now know that this is an inflammatory response to cigarette smoke. We will talk about these three diseases as representatives of inflammatory cigarette injury. AIP, what was in the past, has been called Hammond Rich. This is diffuse alveolar damage. This is an acute lung injury. It is what you and I would call ARDS. Again, many names for this, an acute lung injury to the type 1 cell. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which is usually a fibrotic organizing response most of the time to an infectious process. The infection is gone and you are left with a, with a lung which continues to try to repair itself with fibrosis, and you're left with an area of consolidation. And finally, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. In my practice, the most common fibrotic diagnosis is NSIP. And the one thing I'd like to leave you when you talk about NSIP is that when someone says that to you, you should think, ah, this is the beginning of the workup, not the end.
Now, most of the time when I get somebody who says that they have an open lung biopsy, I assume that that is the diagnosis. But you must know better because this could well be hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It could be they have some form of collagen vascular disease. It could be that they're a smoker and that that smoking is related to the, the, is causing that fibrosis. Most important, it could be that when they say NSIP to you, that is really IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and they have biopsy in an area which is not specific. At that point, your look at the pattern trumps what they found by open lung biopsy. So with that, in 20 minutes, let's go through all of them. IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In general, older men, they got sick over months. They will tell you that they got short of breath progressively and slowly. Most of them will, have, will, will tell you they were cigarette smokers. The clinicians don't put this as part of the smoking-related interstitial lung diseases, but if you look in the literature, 70 to 80 percent of the people who have IPF will be smokers. They will have restrictive pulmonary defects. In other words, their lungs are getting smaller, but they're able to blow out all of their air normally. There are other things associated. They have GE reflex and autoantibodies, but they don't make it for the diagnosis of either lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And finally, the very last thing to remember, the prognosis in patients with IPF is terrible. It is worse than lung cancer. 90% of these people will be dead within two to three years. There are two findings that the pathologists use to make the diagnosis, and I'm going to show you these again to remind you that even though the diagnosis can be made by open lung biopsy, it is not absolutely specific. They look for two things, one of which is called geographic variation, which you see here. Normal alveoli next to very abnormal alveoli. Fibrosis next to normal lung. The second thing that they look for is what's called temporal variation, time variation, and all that means is that these pa this pale area which you see here, this fibroblast focus, means that there's a new area of fibrosis being laid down. And next to it are lots of areas of old fibrosis in the lung, time variation. New areas of injury next to old areas of injury. Early on, many of the clinicians thought that the abnormality was really caused by inflammation, but there's no correlation between the degree of inflammatory cells and the progression of disease. We believe that this abnormality is an abnormality of wound healing. Those of you who get keloids, you know there are some people who get a scar on their arm and, you keep, and the scar keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. No particular reason for it. Something is happening in the lung where there's loss of control of the repair mechanism. And they believe that that is what is happening in patients with IPF. We do know that if you count the number of these fibroblast foci, that it does correlate with the patient's correlate with how they're going to do. The more fibroblast foci, the worse the patient is going to do. The findings, as Ella so nicely pointed out, if you look at this drawing of one lung, the abnormality is strikingly peripheral. The combination of reticulation, cystic change, and honeycombing is the key. I'll repeat that. Honeycombing for me in the right distribution is really the key for me to make this diagnosis. So if we look at three images, the upper lobes are usually involved. Peripheral areas of reticulation, lovely areas of honeycombing, holes with very definite walls. As we work our way down, the abnormality becomes worse. But to appreciate how much worse it is at the bases than is the apex, as Ella so nicely pointed out, you really need to look at a sagittal image. Here you see again that the abnormality is strikingly in the periphery of the lung, and certainly the upper lobe is involved. But as you go down to the base, it is the very lowest slices, the areas in the most dependent and lower part of the lung that are most involved. And whenever you see traction bronchiectasis, you can say there's fibrosis. So if you do a minimum intensity projection of that image, you will note that the airways are markedly distorted. It's much easier to see when I do a minimum intensity projection than in the standard projection of those lungs. But traction bronchiectasis, specific for fibrosis, but not specific for IPF. I'm going to show you that any cause of fibrosis will give you traction bronchiectasis. So first disease, is this a case of IPF? Is it more upper or lower? Here is the upper part. Here's the lower part. Is it more central or peripheral? 
Okay, so this isn't IPF. This is a central abnormality that's more in the upper lobes. The reason I show you this case, this was a case from the archive of the AFIP in which it was sent in, and when they looked at it, it was the typical findings of IPF. In other words, they called this UIP. When I looked at this, I said, sarcoid, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, some kind of upper chronic progressive disease, and it turns out that even though the diagnosis on histology was UIP, the final clinical diagnosis was chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So my point to you is this. There are definitely going to be times when the pathologist will say UIP. You and I as the imagers need to let them know that maybe there's another diagnosis that's possible. Okay, finished with IPF. The next three to four diseases we're going to talk about are smoking related. The first three are all related to these cells. These are smokers macrophages. If you put cigarette smoke into the lung, it responds with inflammatory cells. Not a surprise. If, you look at a, if a pathologist looks at this, they very quickly can tell you that these very dirty brown macrophages that are filled with iron come from a cigarette smoker. And all of these processes, respiratory bronchiolitis, respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, and desquamative interstitial pneumonia, are all basically a spectrum of injury from cigarette smoke. Unfortunately, the names for these came at different times. And Carrington and Liebau thought that DIP was an early phase of IPF. We now know that that's not the case. So everybody who smokes gets this. Here's one of the small airways. When we say small, usually one millimeter, and it has no cartilage. You will notice that there are these respiratory, these small uh, cells within them, these macrophages. The pathologist will tell you that they know that, they that this is a smoker. Everybody who smokes gets RB, or respiratory bronchiolitis. About a quarter of those will have changes on imaging, very nicely shown by Martine Remy Jardin, that when she had people who were smokers, and a lot of them were asymptomatic, about 20% of them would have these small ground glass nodules. And we now know those small ground glass nodules result from those macrophages which are around the small airways. So RB, if you're a smoker, everybody has RB. A small percentage of them will have changes that are upper lobe, small ground glass nodules. A small percentage of those will have symptoms. So everybody who smokes is as RB. A small group of those people who have RB will have symptoms that make you think about an, in an infiltrative lung disease. They may have a little bit more of fibrosis around in the alveolar walls, but for the most part, this is not a pathology diagnosis. They can't tell the difference between RB and RBILD, or respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. And we see basically the same findings in respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. These people who are short of breath have ground glass nodules that are, for the most part, around the airways you can get confluence of those nodules so that you get ground glass, which is much more prominent in the upper lobes. Most chronic inhalational lung diseases are upper lobe. TB, histo, silica, sarcoid, emphysema, lung cancer, all of those are upper lobe processes. The lymphatics in the upper lobes are not very good, even though you inhale most of what you inhale into the bases, most of what stays there is in the upper lobes. So respiratory bronchiolitis, upper lobe, chronic inhalational lung disease. If you get symptoms, it's called respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. DIP is just an extension of RB, RB, ILD. Here, the exact same cells, these exact same cells are in the alveolar spaces, not just around the airways. But these are heavy cigarette smokers. And interestingly enough, this is a more acute process that tends to be in the mid and lower lung zones. Usually we see areas of ground glass. There may be some areas of fibrosis, a little bit of alveolar wall fibrosis, but we don't see honeycombing in the main here. Now, before I move on from these two diseases, I want to try to convince you that RB, RBILD, and DIP are basically all the same disease. It's just where those cells are. On the left-hand side, this is a highly magnified small airway. In the middle of that small airway, what we see are those dirty brown macrophages. If you show that to a pathologist, they say RB. If you're sitting with them at the microscope, and while they're looking away, you accidentally nudge their slide and say, go ahead, look again now. If they looked again and, and saw that most of these abnormalities were out in the alveolar spaces, they'd say, ah, that's DIP. 
Now, do you really think that with something that's three angstroms away with the exact same cells is a different disease? No. The reality is this is all a spectrum of the same inflammatory process. And the typical findings are here. So in the upper lobes, ground glass nodules. In the lower lobes, diffuse areas of ground glass. These people are smokers. It should not surprise you that when you find things of RB and DIP that you also find changes of emphysema, holes in the upper lung fields. Now, you'll notice that these holes are very well circumscribed. Now, it is, and I don't have time to go into it, but you can get some fibrosis when you smoke. This is not honeycombing. These are emphysematous spaces with a little bit of fibrosis around them. So RB, RBILD, and DIP all start part of the same spectrum. And if we did a coronal reconstruction of this, you can probably see the ground glass nodules, these tiny, small ground glass areas with more diffuse areas of ground glass. This is all one disease. In that same vein, if we talk about smoking-related lung disease, I have added Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It is not in that original group, not in that original article about the, about the interstitial lung diseases, but it fits nicely because people who have pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis are smokers. Men pretty much equal to women. They may have dyspnea or cough. A lot of them are asymptomatic. If we look at the abnormality as far as the histology, we see the most important thing are these Langerhans cells, described by Langerhans himself in the 40s. These are cells that you find in the lung, in the skin, in the gut. And these Langerhans cells with these big nuclei and indistinct cytoplasm are what drives this process. You can think about it. If you inhale smoke, you could get macrophages in the lung. Some people respond with Langerhans cells. It is just another inflammatory response to cigarette smoke in the lung. You also have lymphocytes, and you can have some eosinophils. And here is the main findings in people with Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Most of them start out with nodules. These nodules are airway-associated. Over time, there's cavitation of these nodules, and when you see cysts in the lung, for the most part, they are the airways themselves. If the disease progresses even more, you can have cystic spaces with paracicatricial emphysema, so nodules to nodules and cysts to finally diffuse bolus emphysema, upper lobe, inhalational lung disease with inflammation. So if we step quickly through this, the most common abnormality, stellate nodules. They're almost always associated with this small airway that you see here and are represented by these nodules that you would see on high-resolution CT. As the disease progresses, you get cysts, usually well-formed upper lobe, holes in the lung. Some of them have bizarre shapes. Some of them are V-shaped because they are actually the airways. And finally, if the disease continues to progress, you get bolus lung disease that you and I would not make the diagnosis of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. But does it matter? This is another smoking-related lung disease. And whether it was Langerhans cells that created this or macrophages that were the inflammatory change, it probably doesn't matter. So to tie up PLCH, you usually start out with nodules. On the plain film, it's not a surprise that the patient is hyperinflated. They are a smoker. Over time, those nodules are replaced with cysts. And because the cysts may be just under the pleura, about 15% of them will present with a pneumothorax. So if they present with nod upper lobe nodules alone, you and I are not going to make the diagnosis. We may think about a granulomatous process because it's upper lobe. You could think about sarcoid. You could think about silica. You could think about TB or some other granulomatous infection. If we see just upper lobe cysts, especially if you see these sort of crazy shaped kinds of cysts, then you might be able to think of the diagnosis. But it is really the combination of cysts and nodules. If you look at this, here are well-formed cysts and nodules, which are predominantly in the upper lung fields on a background of emphysema in a hyperinflated patient, then you can put this all together as a smoking-related inflammatory disease, emphysema with superimposed pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. That takes care of the smoking-related diseases, RB, RBILD, DIP, and PLCH. Acute interstitial pneumonia, AIP, what used to be called ham and rich. This is what's also known as diffuse alveolar damage. It is what you and I think of as ARDS. There are many terms for this acute lung injury. A lot of these people will have an antecedent flu syndrome, 
and the mortality rate is high, between 50 and 90 percent. There are two phases that I want to show you, and they are important because we can see them imaging-wise. There's an acute edematous or exudative phase of AIP or ARDS or DAD, whatever you'd like to call it. This is an alveolar wall, and you will note it is damaged. You will see a hyaline membrane, and that hyaline membrane is a combination of edematous fluid, debris, damaged type 1 cells. You also have some collapse of alveoli in the early phase. If you survive that acute edematous phase, you can go on to what is called an organizing phase. And in the organizing phase, you will note that the hyaline membranes are gone. And in their place are these blue cells which are covering the alveolar wall. These are type 2 cells which are attempting to heal that damaged alveolar space. You'll note the alveolar walls are very thickened and there are now fibroblasts. Fibrosis is occurring in these patients. Now, this disease involves all five lobes. So here the pattern is helpful. We said RB, predominantly lower lobe. DIP, more in the mid and lower lungs outs. IPF, strikingly peripheral and along the bases. AIP or ARDS, all five lobes. 90% of the lung is involved. You may get a little bit of sparing of the costophrenic angles. The plain film is what you usually see and I see. When I come in in the morning at the University of Maryland, there are 100 films, and people on the ventilator, they all look like this. The patient is ventilated. All five lobes are involved. I never know whether this is infection, edema, some form of nonspecific lung injury. I usually vary what I say just to break the monotony because in reality, it's very hard to know what this is. If you were to take a coronal section, if you could, you would find that the majority of the lung was involved. There is a little bit in the way of sparing here. The vessels are relatively normal. It's probably not edema. There usually isn't anything in terms of there being an effusion. This is a case of proven uh, open lung biopsy, proven AIP, and it's on a, on a background of emphysema, widespread opacity. The reason I showed you this case is if we do some MIP imaging, we can see that the airways are normal. This is in the early phase. That's quite different from somebody who has moved into the organizing phase of AIP. Again, 80, 90 percent of the lung involved, but now look at the major fissure is becoming irregular. There are intralobular septal lines, and if we do a MIP image of this coronal study, we will see that the airways are now becoming very abnormal, distorted, bronchiectatic. As I said, one of the things you can take away from this lecture is that when you see traction bronchiectasis, there is fibrosis in the biopsy. Now, that's not synonymous with saying IPF, but there is some form of fibrosis. So late phase of AIP going into the organizing and fibrotic phase shown to you by traction bronchiectasis. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. This is a response to a prior injury in which you have organization in the alveolar spaces. It is a self-perpetuating in injury and then an attempt to repair. Most of the time, it's post-infectious. We see it in connective tissue diseases, malignancies, drugs, even organ transplantation. Again, most of the time, there's been an infection, the infectious agent is gone, and now you have the lung continuing to try to organize something within the alveolar spaces. And what we see are these plugs, which are called Masson bodies, which are areas of organization of exudate that's in the alveolar spaces, not in the alveolar wall. And the representation as far as imaging is that you and I are going to see areas of consolidation, very different from what I've shown you before. Consolidation. In the ER, 90% of the time, 95, areas of consolidation, infection, 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 infection. Here, if the infection doesn't go away or they treat them and you're left with persistent areas of consolidation, think organizing pneumonia. The most common finding at the AFIP, and I must see 20 cases a week, of somebody who has an area of consolidation is organizing pneumonia. It's a very common response within the lung. These areas of consolidation tend to follow along the bronchovascular bundles. So if we do a parasagittal image, we will see that the abnormality is in the periphery, but not at the absolute periphery. They tend to talk about these diseases as peripheral, and yes, that's true, but I usually find that the absolute periphery of the lung is less involved. I just want to show you this one image before I go on to the last disease and this to remind you that people with organizing pneumonia can present as a solitary pulmonary nodule and it can look frighteningly malignant. 
So you have people with this areas of nodules, an old case from the archive, one from last year, and we have this nodule with some speculation and maybe even a plural tag. You and I are going to have to be concerned that this is malignant just to point out that organizing pneumonia can be very focal. Almost all of these were prior infections. The infection's gone. There's an area of organization. Unfortunately, most of these are going to have to come out. Last disease, and we're done. Nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, first described by Katzenstein in 1994, and she found a group of patients who had fibrosis that did not fit into all those other diseases I talked to you about, IPF, RBILD, DIP, OP, or even the fibrotic phase of acute interstitial pneumonia. A lot of these people had collagen vascular disease. The most important thing is that, in general, they had a, progno a better prognosis. Now. There are three categories, either cellular, fibrosing, or mixed, and a lot of these have organizing pneumonia in addition that complicates it. The only thing I want you to remember is that these people can have a lot of fibrosis, and the more fibrosis they have, the worse their prognosis, and their prognosis can be very similar to IPF if they have a lot of fibrosis. As I said, I wanted you to remember that if somebody says NSIP to you, it is the beginning of the workup and not the end. Because when the uh, physicians and radiologists at, at the Mayo Clinic looked at patients with NSIP, they found that a third of them had imaging that was absolutely diagnostic for IPF. So some of these people really have IPF and they haven't been able to biopsy the right area. Some of them had hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Some of them had organizing pneumonia. So within the diagnosis of NSIP are multiple other diagnoses. And this is confirmed by Andrew Nicholson, a very well-known pathologist from the Brompton, who says when he says the NSIP pattern, he thinks about these. Sampling error in patient has IPF, someone who's just a smoker and has got a little bit of fibrosis, someone who has hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it may be post-infectious, it may be related to collagen vascular disease. The typical findings are areas of ground glass and maybe a little consolidation along the bronchovascular bundles in the lower lobes. If we look at the CT, ground glass, reticulation, predominantly at the bases, but no honeycombing. The best way to separate IPF from NSIP is the presence of honeycombing. It's not perfect, but people have honeycombing, think IPF. You see no honeycombing, all you can say is fibrosis. Now, how do we know this person has fibrosis? Again, I find the MIP, MIP imaging very helpful. Here we see, again, traction bronchiectasis buried in the areas of ground glass. There is no doubt in your mind or mine that this person has fibrosis, but it doesn't make it for the diagnosis of IPF. There is no honeycombing. And I just wanted to say one more thing before we close, and that is that there are people who have organizing pneumonia, biopsy proven here, who can go on as they begin to heal to have changes that six months later are basically called NSIP. So one of the healing routes from OP is NSIP. So let's tie this all together. People who have IPF have predominantly peripheral abnormalities with reticulation and honeycombing. The smoking-related lung diseases, respiratory bronchiolitis, those macrophages around the small airways give you ground glass nodules that are predominantly in the upper lung disease, upper lobes. RB, RBILD, and DIP are all in a spectrum. The only difference is that DIP will include some ground glass down at the bases. Pulmonary longer Hans cell histiocytosis, another smoking-related disease. Nodules, starts out as nodules around the airways. Over time, it becomes nodules and cysts. Those cysts are actually the airways. You can end up with terrible uh, bullous emphysema, but that's a late change. AIP, all five lobes, this is basically ARDS. As they go into the fibrotic phase, they get traction bronchiectasis. And finally, organizing pneumonia, areas of consolidation. And NSIP in the literature is basically ground glass more at the bases. But remember, when somebody says NSIP, it might look like IPF to you, at which point it really is IPF. It could be they're just a cigarette smoker with some well-circumscribed holes. It could be hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And it could really be organizing pneumonia that's gone on to NSIP. I've gone over by a couple of minutes, so I'm going to stop and move on so we have time for Dr. Bankier, who is going to talk to you about emphysema. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. 
Um, in the following 30 minutes, I will try to answer the following questions. What is pulmonary emphysema? Why is this an important disease? How do we image pulmonary emphysema? What do we see? How much of the disease do we see? And what about the context, the medical context of pulmonary emphysema? So first, what is pulmonary emphysema? Emphysema is defined as an abnormal permanent enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles, accompanied by destruction of respiratory tissue and without fibrosis. This is the definition that you will find in the textbooks. The important element about this definition is that emphysema is defined in strictly anatomical terms. When we talk about emphysema, we don't talk about uh, prim primarily clinical presentation or physiology or lung function. Here we are really uh, in anatomy and in morphology. The key concept of the definition of emphysema is destru destruction, irreversible destruction of lung parenchyma, and as this house is destroyed by a storm, so will the lung parenchyma be eventually destroyed, completely destroyed by pulmonary emphysema. The definition of emphysema is based on microscopy. We see reflections of emphysema in microscopy and in radiology, but whenever we talk about emphysematous changes, we should try to relate microscopy, macroscopy, and radiology, and in fact, most of the substantial research about emphysema is about the interrelation between changes seen in radiology, microscopy, and microscopy. This is a normal lung on microscopy. This is a microscopic specimen of a patient with emphysema. The key feature is the destruction of alve alveolar walls, the irre irreversible destruction of lung tissue. Uh, the same at a different level of magnification, uh, pat a gross pathologic slice of a uh, normal lung, and here a uh, section of a patient with emphysema. Again, uh, changes uh, congruent with irreversible destruction of lung parenchyma, and finally, at yet another level of magnification, normal lung on this coronal reconstruction and irreversible destruction of lung parenchyma by emphysema. We are basically looking at the same thing, but at different levels of uh, uh, resolution and at different levels of magnification. Why is emphysema important? Uh, there are about two million cases of uh, pure emphysema among the uh, community of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. More importantly, the extrapolations for the future, for the year 2020, say that emphysema will get an even more important role, both as a cause for morbidity and a cause for mortality. Emphysema also is a very expensive disease. Here are uh, recent features from Europe. Uh, emphysema, for example, uh, causes costs of uh, one billion uh, pharmaceutical uh, expenses in Europe. If you want to have the figure in US dollars, you just multiply uh, these numbers by 1.5. So this is a tremendously expensive disease. What are the risk factors for emphysema? These risk factors are well known for a very long time. One of them is environmental pollution. Another one of them is dusts to which uh, certain professions are exposed, coal miners, for example, but also dentists. Uh, the use of uh, cosmetic aerosols have also been accused to be causative of pulmonary emphysema. Fortunately, I personally don't need this anymore. How do we image pulmonary emphysema? When we talk about the imaging of pulmonary emphysema, we mainly speak about CT. Why? Well, first, because the conventional radiograph is quite insensitive in detecting emphysematous changes, notably if they are not very advanced. And on the other hand, MR suffers from relatively poor spatial resolution uh, in the depiction of emphysematous lesions. Although we have been introducing multi-detector CT and other techniques uh, in the past decade, uh, the key technical parameters for imaging emphysema uh, are known quite, since quite a long time. First of all, 
uh, if emphysema is suspected, we need to perform thin sections, meaning sections between 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters in collimation. We need to image the patients in full inspiration. Expiratory scans in pure emphysema are of very little help. We do not need to give the patient contrast material. And recent studies have shown that we can considerably reduce the patient dose and still obtain adequate levels uh, of diagnostic accuracy when we're looking for pulmonary emphysema. There are other additional techniques that we can use to enhance the visualization of emphysema. One of them has been shown by Dr. Galvin before. This is the uh, minimum intensity projection technique uh, as presented in emphysema by Martine Remy Jardin. She proved that uh, this, techniques helps, uh, this technique helps to detect mild forms of emphysema. As shown here on the very left, you have a conventional HRCT section, and on the very right, you have this minimum intensity projection that indeed reveals lesions that were not visible on the conventional image. Uh, this slide is to illustrate what I said before. When looking at this radiograph, you might suspect that there are some very subtle abnormalities in the region of the aortic pulmonary window or in the region of uh, the paratracheal area on the right. But just looking at the chest radiograph, you would probably never suspect how extensive these emphysematous lesions in fact are on the CT image. So conventional chest radiography really suffers from, suffers from sensitivity in detecting emphysematous changes. The radiographic signs and the CT signs of pulmonary emphysema are relatively limited and relatively typical. We see disruption or distortion of vascular structures. We see an increase in lung transparency on the radiograph or a focal decrease in lung attenuation on the CT image, and we see focal destruction of lung tissue. So again, on the radiograph, distortion of vascular structures, an increase in transparency, a decrease in lung attenuation, and focal areas of lung destruction. These are the most important findings for pulmonary emphysema. In Textbooks, notably of the older generation, you might find uh, things stating or passages stating that the classical radiographic signs of emphysema uh, are uh, the flattening of the diaphragms, the increase of the uh, interrib spaces, the increase in the retrosternal space or in the retrocardiac space. This in fact, are not typical radiographic signs of emphysema, but are rather signs of the obstruction and the overinflation of the thorax that can accompany emphysema, but that, do, that does not necessarily accompany emphysema. So these changes are, uh, that were previously called the classical radiological signs of emphysema are in fact the result of overinflation, and you might find overinflation in other diseases such as asthma and a lot of other diseases that do not, that do not have anything to do with pulmonary emphysema. What do we see in pulmonary emphysema? According to the destruction of the lung parenchyma and the pattern and the distribution of the changes in the lung parenchyma, we uh, can differentiate two important subtypes of emphysema, and these two subtypes are the so-called centrilobular and the so-called panlobular emphysema. In centrilobular emphysema, we see focal spots of lung destruction. Immediately neighboring these spots of lung destruction, we have normal or almost normal lung parenchyma, and the bronchial and vascular structures in these areas of uh, parenchyma are preserved. They are not destroyed. This is the corresponding section in, uh, in a paper-mounted section. We see that these areas are focal areas of destruction, uh, but you also can see that these uh, 
uh, hexagonal shape of the secondary pulmonary lobule, although the entire parenchyma inside is destroyed, the shape of the secondary pulmonary lobule is still preserved. And the same is seen on CT images. We see holes in the lung without, uh, without walls. These holes are, the border of these holes are, is normal lung parenchyma. And if we look for the secondary pulmonary lobule, we will find this anatomic structure. And in most cases, we will also find the uh, central core structures in the secondary pulmonary lobule. Even if centrilobular emphysema is very far advanced, we still will be able to find the secondary pulmonary lobule in these patients. So in centrilobular emphysema, the well-defined holes give the pattern of destruction a heterogeneous appearance because the holes are uh, just neighboring normal lung parenchyma. The structures of the secondary pulmonary lobule are preserved. It, this is the classical manifestation of emphysema in cigarette smokers. It has a clear upper lobe predominance, and uh, there are some focal manifestations of centrilobular emphysema that are mainly related to dust inhalation. <coughs> the second type of emphysema is panlobular emphysema. Here, the pattern of destruction is much more widespread. There are some very sparse area of lung parenchyma around, but mo in most instances, this lung parenchyma is not normal, and the, the, the vascular and bronchial structures tend to be either dis destroyed or uh, disrupted. This is uh, the gross pathology section, the paper-mounted section. We see that we don't find the structure of the secondary pulmonary lobule anymore, and the visual impression is that the pattern of destruction is much more widespread, much more diffuse than in centrilobular emphysema. And finally, this is what we also see on CT. The process is very widespread. Uh, other than in centrilobular emphysema, we cannot exactly tell where the process starts and where the process ends. It more looks like an effacement of lung structure, as if somebody would have er just erased, just rubbed, uh, rubbed part of the, uh, of the lung parenchyma. And these are just two other cases that illustrate this uh, very diffuse appearance of panlobular emphysema very well. So uh, panlobular emphysema has a very homogeneous pattern of destruction. The structures of the secondary pulmonary lobules are destroyed. In most cases, panlobular emphysema will be associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, the distribution of the destruction is rather diffuse and can have a lower lobe predominance. Uh, there are patients in whom you will find both types of emphysema. This is such a case, uh, such a patient that has uh, centrilobular emphysema, centrilobular lesions in the upper regions of his lung and panlobular areas of destruction in the lower part of his lung. So finding both patterns in one patient is a thing that is not uncommon. There are also patients that will have emphysematous lesions uh, and fibrosis, like here. On the left, you see fibrosis on the basis of the lung, and on the right, emphysematous lesions in the apex of the lung. And you will remember what I said uh, in the beginning. The, uh, the definition of emphysema ends with that this is a destruction of respiratory tissue, but without fibrosis. Here we have to remember that the definition of emphysema is based on histology, and uh, this definition is not incorrect and applies to the patho pathologic or histologic uh, context and is not invalid just because fibrosis and emphysema may coexist on a uh, radiological level on a level of less magnification. Uh, so it is uh, also relatively common to find patients with lesions corresponding to emphysema and lesions corresponding to pulmonary fibrosis on one CT examination. There are other subtypes, so-called subtypes of emphysema, soft tissue emphysema, bullous emphysema, parasicatricial emphysema. I just put this into brackets, paraseptal emphysema. Uh, 
often the term emphysema is used as a syn synonym for pathologic accumulation of air. But this does not uh, match with the, with the very definition of emphysema that I show you here again. It is clear that in so-called paracicatricial emphysema, there is scarring, there is traction on the lung uh, uh, parenchyma, there is distension of the lung parenchyma, but this does not really, is not really congruent with the, with the very stringent uh, histologic definition of emphysema. This is so-called soft tissue emphysema. It is clear that there is pathologic accumulation of air in the soft tissue, but this has nothing to do with lung emphysema as uh, according to the definition of emphysema. How much emphysema do we see? This is a question that has become increasingly important in the recent years, just because emphysema is more and more considered as a treatable disease. There is the possibility of uh, lung reduction surgery. Uh, there are new drugs on the market. There are devices such as these endobronchial valves that can be implanted in patients with emphysema or little uh, artificial fenestrations of obstructed lung parenchyma. And for, all of, for the planning of all these therapeutic interventions, it is important not only to know that the patient has emphysema, but also how severe his emphysema is. One way to assess this is by subjective assessment. There are widely used grading systems. Uh, these grading systems uh, grade emphysema according to the extent. This is presumed to reflect severity. These grading systems show good correlation with pathology. However, they may underestimate mild emphysema. When comparing subjective and objective quantification, it has been shown that uh, subjective quantification tends to overestimate emphysema and has a higher interreader variability. This is why uh, in a more scientific context, it's probably uh, desirable to have an objective approach to the quantification of emphysema. Anyway, the subjective and objective quantification of emphysema uh, answer to different questions. Subjective quantification of emphysema is based on correlations and uh, answers to which degree the extent of emphysema is linked to the extent of emphysema assessed by a given reference method. And in objective quantification, we look for identity and try to answer the question to which degree is the extent of emphysema identical to the extent of emphysema, for example, in pathology or in microscopy. How does the objective quantification of emphysema work? This is rather straightforward. Many products on the market just segment the lung out of the thorax. They quantify the uh, Hounsfield values for each given pixel, and then they will, dis they will uh, compute the distribution curves of the different densities, the so-called histogram. This would be a normal distribution, a normal histogram, and because in emphysema we have more values with low attenuation, uh, the histogram curve in emphysema is typically shifted to the left. Uh, there are different approaches that quantify emphysema by using this histogram, by using, this distribu by using a certain uh, percentile of these distribution curves, either the lowest 5 percentile or the lowest 12 percentile. Um, the problem with that is that there is little CT microscopic correlation for this approach, and uh, as you will easily understand, there is a problem of coexisting uh, pathology. This method works well if the patient has only emphysema, but for example, if you have a patient like this, this is the same patient than before that has emphysema in the, uh, in the top of the lung and fibrosis in the basis of the lung, then the emphysema will shift the histogram to the left, but the fibrosis will again shift the histogram to the right because of the higher uh, density, and this will falsify um, your, uh, your objective quantification of emphysema. Therefore, other authors have proposed to choose a single threshold value, a threshold of density, and they say, for example, that all values between the threshold of minus 950 Hounsfield units will correspond to emphysema, and uh, these computer programs can then 
quantify exactly to how much percentage of the lung parenchyma this will correspond. There have been different thresholds uh, proposed in the literature. The oldest one is from Dr. Müller and co-workers. Then there was one uh, in the mid-1990s proposed for thin section CT. And very recently, there has been uh, another uh, threshold proposed in the literature which is, which is uh, minus 960 to minus 960 uh, to minus 970 and this is a valid threshold for multi-detector CT imaging of pulmonary emphysema. The final point, what about the context of emphysema? Emphysema belongs to what is clinically called the chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. Emphysema, as we saw, is a disease of the lung parenchyma. However, COPD in general also uh, has contributors that is located in the airways uh, due to airway inflammation and air airway wall remodeling and in the vascular due to structural thickening. And the clinically important and relevant uh, questions to ask uh, or question to ask is how do these three contributors, to which extent do these three contrib contributors cause the airflow limitation and the gas exchange abnormalities that we see in COPD? And here CT might be very helpful because CT indeed allows us to visualize at least two of these uh, potential contributors, for example, lung parenchyma and airways. There are a number of studies published uh, that did look simultaneously at the airways and at the lung parenchyma. Uh, this is very straightforward. You know all from your daily practice that on thin sections we see the airway structures very well. Let me just uh, give you two examples of those studies. One comes from Italy. Uh, they found that uh, bronchial wall measures, measurements and uh, lung attenuation me measurements allow to differentiate patients with COPD that have chronic bronchitis, which in many instances is reversible, and those that have no chronic bronchitis, meaning that the COPD uh, contribution comes from emphysema, which is an irreversible uh, uh, destruction. And in fact, these two different groups of patients have differences, significantly differ significant differences in lung attenuation. Another study that uh, comes to similar results uh, comes from Great Britain. They tried to identify various patterns of emphysema, various distribution patterns that uh, would be linked to airflow obstruction and gas transfer abnormalities. They found that not only the extent of emphysema, but also the distribution of emphysematous lesions in the lung is something that is very important. So in the future, we will have to look not only at the overall extent of the disease, but also at the distribution and at the different patterns of emphysema. Another way to approach the thing uh, is to look simultaneously at the lung parenchyma and at the lung vascular, vasculature. We are currently studying this approach. We image the patients with emphysema uh, without contrast material. We measure lung attenuation, but then we give the patient a contrast material and uh, uh, perform these perfusion maps, and we are hoping to uh, find uh, how the parenchymal destruction matches or does not matches with impaired perfusion. And uh, uh, we try to get uh, important or hopefully important information uh, from the longitudinal evaluation of these parenchymal and perfusion uh, uh, abnormalities that we see in these patients. So in summary, we were talking first about the definition of emphysema. This is purely morphological. We were talking a little bit about the epidemiology of emphysema. I briefly uh, uh, talked about the technique of pulmonary emphysema. We discussed the two important entities, which are uh, centrilobular and panlobular emphysema. Uh, I briefly discussed the problems of the quantification of emphysema and why this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, and I tried to place emphysema in the context of the uh, clinically important uh, entities called chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. How will the imaging of emphysema 
evolve from here, uh, we will surely progress from a mere quantification to uh, the mapping of emphysema, including uh, distribution patterns and clusters of distribution. Uh, we will surely make a step from the quanti quantification of emphysema to the more integrative imaging of COPD uh, by assessing bronchial morphometry, by assessing the pulmonary vasculature, and by attempting the so-called phenotyping of emphysema uh, by means of imaging. And uh, finally, we will move from static to a more dynamic imaging with the new technical uh, advantages that we have. Thank you very much for your attention.